How long will the Lake of Fire be in operation? Stay tuned. God is at peace with the world. He is at peace with you. How can this be? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was entombed. Jesus was roused the third day. God gives us time indicators throughout the scriptures. Some are very specific, some are quite vague. And he never seems to give us as much information as we want. But we should pay very close attention to all of his time indicators because they all reveal truth and help us to understand more clearly his good, pleasing, and perfect will for his entire creation. Very little is said about the lake of fire in the scriptures. The small amount God does reveal is fascinating, especially when he reveals that it does not operate forever, as many falsely teach. Let's have us a look-see. Let's start in Revelation 19.20, which is the first mention of the lake of fire in the scriptures and in the book of Revelation from the concordant literal New Testament. And the wild beast is arrested, and with it the false prophet who does the signs in its sight by which he deceives those getting the emblem of the wild beast, and those worshiping its image. Living, the two were cast into the lake of fire, burning with sulfur. So we have the wild beast and the false prophet are the two that are cast alive into the lake of fire. This will occur at the return of Christ to the earth, to take over the earth and reign for the eons of the eons, which we will look at shortly. Next, I want to look at Revelation 20, 11 through 15 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. And I perceived a great white throne and him who is sitting upon it, from whose face earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I perceived the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Now it's important to note that the first time that the lake of fire is called the second death is in relation to these mortals that are raised at the great white throne judgment. And they are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. So what happens to the humans that are cast into the lake of fire? They die. They're dead. Later in Revelation 21.8, we read this. Now this is during the new heaven and new earth eon. So the death state still remains even though in Revelation 21 4 God says clearly death will be no more which is speaking of the dying event. Yet the timid and unbelievers and the abominable and murderers and paramours and enchanters and idolaters and all the false their part is in the lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Again, we have the lake of fire called the second death in relation to mortal humans being cast into it. Now we will see the time indicator concerning the lake of fire in Revelation 20.10. Now this event takes place after the thousand years, right before the great white throne. So this is actually sandwiched in between the wild beast and the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire and mortals being cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 10, concordant literal New Testament. And the adversary, Satan, who is deceiving them, was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur where the wild beast and the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. So we see the wild beast and the false prophet are also, they are already there. They were cast there before the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. And they, the wild beast, the false prophet, and Satan, shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. This is our time indicator 
of the duration of the lake of fire. Well, there you have it. The eons of the eons. That is the duration of the lake of fire. I know, that's kind of vague, but like I tell my kids, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But I think we can understand a little bit more of what the eons of the eons is. Let's look at the Eonian chart. Here we have the Eonian times chart. Uh, we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five. We're concerned with the eons of the eons. The present eon is the present wicked eon, according to Galatians 1.4. The eons of the eons are the two good eons that will follow, eon 4 and eon 5. Now concerning the lake of fire, the wild beast and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire at the return of Christ at the end of this present wicked eon. And we can see the lake of fire endures and operates throughout the next two eons, which includes the thousand years and the new heaven and new earth eon. The second death does not kick in until the great white throne judgment after the thousand years. So the lake of fire actually lasts and endures and operates longer than the second death and Satan himself is not cast into the lake of fire to be tormented until after the thousand years now he is said to be tormented for the eons of the eons it can we can see it's the eons of the eons because it's part of eon 4 and the duration of eon 5 because at the consummation of the eons is when Christ is done reigning and ruling, and he hands the completed kingdom to his Father. So we can see that Christ reigns for the eons of the eon, which is eon 4 and eon 5. It's interesting that the only time indicator associated with the lake of fire has to do with Satan, the worst offender in the lake of fire. I'll tell you why this is important in just a moment. But first, I want to show you the popular misconception of the duration of the lake of fire, and it is based on a horrible mistranslation concerning Revelation 20.10 and the duration of the lake of fire. Let's turn to Revelation 20.10 and Old Crusty. Some say it's Old Trusty, but I say it's Old Crusty, the King James Version. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with a beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's not only forever, it's forever mm -hmm. and ever. As if forever isn't long enough to indicate everlasting. They have to put forever and ever. Why don't they say another and ever? Well, let's take a look at the Greek and see what the Greek says. Here we are on Bible Hub. Let's take a look at the Greek here on Revelation 2010, where the King James says they'll be tormented forever and ever. Here we see it says they will be tormented day and night to, which four is a better translation there, the ages of the ages. Now, if it was to the ages of the ages, then that would mean that the duration of the lake of fire would end before it even started because the ages of the ages are or the eons of the eons are eons four and five if they were tormented only to the ages of the ages that does not make sense they will be tormented day and night for the ages of the ages and we can see here the first ages or eons is ionos and it, it's in the plural and the second one is ionon and it also is in the plural. So we have the eons of the eons. Forever and ever is nonsensical. It doesn't take into account the plural. And it's just a bad translation. Forever and ever means everlasting. That is not the duration of the lake of fire. You would think a king would be smarter than that. Let's gather a bit more information on the eons the oncoming eons, the eons of the eons, Ephesians 2-7 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. In the oncoming eons, he, God, should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So we see that there are oncoming eons, a plurality of eons, the eons of the eons, the two good eons out of the five eons. 
Here we have another example of the eons of the eons from Revelation 11:15. And the seventh messenger trumpets and loud voices occurred in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world became our Lord's and his Christ's, and he shall be reigning for the eons of the eons. Amen. Luke 1:33 tells us, And Jesus shall reign over the house of Jacob for the eons. And of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. So again, we see that Jesus reigns for multiple eons. And we see the duration of the reign of those who reign with Christ. And night shall be no more, and they, God's slaves, have no need of lamplight and sunlight, for the Lord God shall be illuminating them, and they shall be reigning for the eons of the eons. Revelation 22, 5. So the reign of Christ comes to an end, contrary to what is often taught. Why is that? How can that be? How can his reign come to an end? Well, it comes to an end because his reign is successful. He accomplishes all of God's will. He does everything that the Father sent him to do. So we see very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, it says, For he must be reigning, talking about Jesus, until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. Notice it says very clearly, reigning until. So thanks be to God that Jesus effectively does everything that he was sent to do. That is good news. Who wants him reigning over unsubjected people forever? People that are rebellious forever. Fallen angels that are rebellious forever. Who wants a creation that has everlasting hell that would be a black eye on God's creation and completely against God's will for his creation. Satan's torment is limited to the duration for the eons of the eons. Christ's reign is for the eons of the eons. So we see the limiting on this because he reigns until his reign is successfully completed. Does Satan's time in the lake of fire accomplish anything? Jesus tells us the purpose for all judgment in John 5. Jesus tells us in John 5, 22 through 23, For neither is the Father judging anyone, but has given all judging to the Son, that all may be honoring the Son, according as they are honoring the Father. He who is not honoring the Son is not honoring the Father who sends him. So we see the purpose of all judging that Jesus will do, that all may be honoring the Son, according as they are honoring the Father. Now, obviously, not all are honoring the Son, and not all are currently honoring the Father. But that is one of the main purposes for judgment, that all may be honoring the Son according as they are honoring the Father. Now, is this just limited to humans? No, this is speaking of the entire creation. It says all judging. All judging was given to Jesus for this great purpose. So Satan's time in the lake of fire will be beneficial for God's purposes for the adversary. God does not torment just to torment. He does not judge just to judge. He does not punish just to punish. God's will for all of his creation is much loftier than that. All judgment has a purpose. But you may ask, how can God let Satan go from the lake of fire after all that he has done throughout the course of human history and even before that? Let's not focus on what Satan has done. Otherwise, we could focus on what you've done or what I've done. I think it's a much smarter approach to focus on what Christ has done, not only for us as humans, but also for Satan and all adversaries of God. God often reveals to us the scope of Christ's work, but despite that, many in Christianity and Orthodox Christianity deny his work on the cross, deny his successful work on the cross. Let's see what God says about it in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature. For in him is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him and for him. And he is before all, and all has its cohesion in him. And he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is sovereign, firstborn from among the dead, that in all he may be becoming first. For in him the entire complement delights to dwell, and through him to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. We can see the scope here highlighted in yellow. In him, Christ, is all created. 
that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, including Satan, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him and for him. And then at the bottom, through him to reconcile all to him. Through Christ to reconcile all to God, making peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. Again, we have the all-encompassed creation created by God through Christ. That is what he reconciled, everything. He made peace through the blood of his cross, all on earth and those in the heavens. That is the scope of the true Jesus work. That is the successful Savior that you will not hear about in church. That is a successful Savior that you will not hear about from the enemies of the cross that deny what he accomplished on the cross. Because of Christ's successful work on the cross, that will lead to the reconciliation of all and peace through the blood of his cross. This will be one of the final results, one of the final glorious results of that. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore also God highly exalts him, that's Christ, and graces him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, for the glory of God the Father. So we see clearly that God graces Jesus with the name that is above every name. And we see that in the name of Jesus, every knee should be bowing. And we see that every tongue should be acclaiming. So we have every name, every knee, and every tongue. They are all underneath Jesus, and they will all be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. Celestial and terrestrial and subterranean. This is all encompassing, including Satan, including Hitler, including Saul the Pharisee, who became Paul, including all the enemies of Christ. At the end of this video, I will link some related videos where I go into a little more detail on Philippians 2 9 through 11 and some other passages related to this current video. So why did God only give us a time indicator on the lake of fire when he was telling us about Satan and his time of torment in the lake of fire? I don't know, but I have an idea. It's the same reason why he saved Saul the Pharisee, the foremost sinner. Paul tells us about his transformation from Saul the Pharisee to Paul the Apostle in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16. He says, I, who formerly was a calumniator, which is also a blasphemer, and a persecutor and an outrager, but I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it being ignorant in unbelief. Yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I. But therefore was I shown mercy, that in me the foremost, Jesus Christ, should be displaying all his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be believing on him for life, Eonian. So Paul tells us that he was the foremost sinner. How did God treat the foremost sinner? Paul said, I was shown mercy. Paul said the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So Saul the Pharisee was shown mercy, grace, faith, and love, and he was overwhelmed with these by the Lord. And he was shown these because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, all sinners, even the foremost sinner, so that Jesus Christ should be displaying all his patience for a pattern. Saul the Pharisee is a pattern of the mercy, the grace, the faith, and the love that Christ overwhelms sinners with. If I want to prove to you how strong I am, I'm going to lift the biggest rock in the pile, not the smallest. If I want to prove to you how loving I am, I'm going to love the most unlovable, not somebody who may deserve my love. If I'm going to show you how great my grace is, I'm going to show it to those with the greatest quantity of sin to show the power of my grace. And this is exactly what God has done with Saul the Pharisee, the foremost human sinner, and with Satan, the greatest sinner of all. He has gone to the extreme to show that he can save the worst. And he does this because in the Old Testament, 
people were always doubting, and even up until today, but people were doubting that God's arm and hand were long enough to actually save. But God says very clearly in Isaiah 59.1, Behold, the hand of Yahweh is not too short to save. And as I said, this carries on into today, where the eternal tormentists and the annihilationists who deny the full scope of the work of the cross basically are teaching that God's hand is too short to save, even though that is why Jesus came to this earth was to save all. Jesus tells us in John 3.17 why the Father sent him, one of the reasons why the Father sent him. For God does not dispatch his Son into the world that he should be judging the world, but that the world may be saved through him. He came to actually save the world. The salvation of all, the salvation of the world, the salvation of the cosmos was accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection of Christ. It's a done deal. Whether you believe it or not, you were saved on the cross. Whether you believe it or not, Satan's reconciliation is based on the work of the cross. Whether you believe it or not, Hitler was saved on the cross. So God has shown us that his hand is long enough to save even the worst of us. So that means his hand is long enough to save the rest of us. If it's long enough for the worst, it's long enough for all. This is a simple truth. And here's another simple truth straight from the scriptures. God says in Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? So I'm asking you, is anything too hard for God? I encourage you to believe that all things are possible for God. Because Christ said so, because of this verse, and understand that it is God's will for all to be saved and come to a realization of the truth. So please consider this. If God has good in store for the worst offender in the lake of fire, how much more so the rest in the lake of fire, whether they are supernatural beings or mortal humans? God's treatment of Satan, the adversary, will reveal God's greatest love, mercy, and grace for an enemy of God. And this proves his grace, love, and mercy are sufficient to transform all Enemies who will acclaim Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.